Hey everyone, I'm Megan Kelly. Welcome to the Megan Kelly Show. Such a sad day. I know you're feeling it too. It's happened again. It's hard to believe it's happened again. There's something different when it happens to children, when it happens inside of a school. It's just every time you think this has to be the last time. We can't be living in this inhumane of a society and yet you get proven wrong 19 innocent elementary school children elementary school children and two teachers gunned down while trying to learn probably sitting there getting excited for the end of the year summer so close you can taste it there's an extra happy atmosphere inside of school these days you know Amongst the teachers and the students, right? Can't you see it when you drop your own kids off right now? And they went into their elementary school just outside of San Antonio, Texas, in a town called Uval. And they were murdered. 19 kids at a school in a truly evil attack, along with two teachers. Evil. There's no other word for it. It's a story that's become all too familiar in America. A male, teenaged, loner, reportedly bullied. From a troubled family, absentee mom, absentee dad, posts disturbing content online, warning signs to those paying attention, but who was, who was in this case, who then goes on to kill in cold blood, mercilessly. Today, we're learning more disturbing details about this 18-year-old killer and how he managed to obtain his guns. We will not be naming him, consistent with my own long-standing policy, since studies have shown that mass shooters typically desire infamy, and we decline to help, and others in the media would do well to pay attention to that. But before we get to all that, more on the lives taken yesterday in Texas. It's almost too much to bear, but what kind of a society are we if we brush past the innocent children who were killed in an effort to go right to policy? It makes it too easy for us. Those of us who are still here, those of us who need to take a hard look at what leads to something like this. These little children were casualties in whatever societal sickness this is, and they deserve to be remembered. Like fourth grader Amari Jo Garza. Her grandmother spoke to the Daily Beast. She appears to have spoken with a classmate of Amari's and says the gunman walked into the classroom and told the children, You're going to die. It's horrific. This little girl did what she had likely been taught to do by the adults who loved her. She called 911 for help, and the gunman shot her, as she did. Her best friend was, oh, look at this little girl. Her best friend was sitting next to a Mary and wound up covered in her blood. Also among the dead, 10-year-old McKenna Elrod, a family friend posted online, Sweet McKenna, look at her, with her bright red headband, her sassy smile. She looks like she knows something, doesn't she? Her friend posted, Sweet McKenna, rest in paradise. My heart is shattered as my daughter loved her so much. It's not just the family members who grieve. It's everyone in the town, in the community, the friends, the family, the church members, and now all of us. Another family's burden, that much more horrific, because they are now being forced to bury two children. One is 10-year-old Annabelle Guadalupe Rodriguez. Her desperate father spent much of the day searching for her until the worst news of his life was confirmed. Her cousin was also killed, but has not yet been named. 10-year-old Xavier Javier Lopez also died. He's being remembered as a child who was bubbly and loved to dance with his brothers and his mom. Eight-year-old Osea Garcia's grandfather says he was the sweetest little boy he had ever known. They last saw each other over spring break and played football. His grandfather says he could really catch the ball well. And then there are the teachers. Ava Morales, one of the first victims identified, a loving mother and wife, who is said to have been someone who lived life to the fullest. Absolutely beautiful outside in this shot in front of the mountains, looking so happy. And Irma Garcia, a mother of four, she'd been nominated for Teacher of the Year not long ago. There are more. This is just a snapshot of some of the lives lost.
As the devastated community gathered, the Archbishop of San Antonio could be seen comforting families outside the Civic Center. One man there was heard sobbing into his phone. She's gone. Meanwhile, in Washington, the flag at the U.S. Capitol building was lowered in honor of those killed. We now know that the gunman was finally stopped by a Border Patrol agent who was nearby when the shooting broke out. We do not yet know the identity of that agent, but we understand he was injured in the fight. We've also learned more about the events leading up to the attack and that police were on the scene before the killer barricaded himself in a classroom. Listen. So what we do know is that the shooter was involved in a uh, domestic disturbance with his grandmother prior to the shooting at the school. He did shoot his grandmother at that point. He then fled in a vehicle and was in close proximity near the school where we got calls to local law enforcement at the Uvalde Police Department received a call of a crashed vehicle and a individual armed with a weapon uh, making his way into the school. At that point, we had local law enforcement, uh, school officers, as well as state troopers uh, who were first on scene and were able to hear the actual gunshots inside the class. Classroom. They tried to make entry into the building. They were met with gunfire by the suspect, by the shooter. Some of those officers were shot. So at that point, they began breaking windows around the school, trying to evacuate children, teachers, anybody they could, uh, trying to get them out of that building, out of that school. What we do know at that point, the shooter was able to make entry into a classroom, barricaded himself inside that classroom, and again, just began shooting uh, numerous children and teachers that were in that classroom. Just began shooting anyone that was in his way. At that point, we had a tactical law enforcement mm-hmm. team arrive uh, made up of multiple federal officers, local officers, as well as state troopers that were able to make forcible entry into that classroom. They were met with gunfire as well, but they were able to shoot and kill that suspect. As you just heard, the killer also shot his own grandmother prior to the attack on the school. We are told as of this hour, she is in critical condition. That information eerily reminiscent of another mind boggling school shooting. Newtown. In that attack nearly 10 years ago, the gunman shot and killed his own mother before going on to murder 20 six and seven year olds at Sandy Hook Elementary and another six adults. A little later in this show, we will be joined by Neil Heslin, a father who lost his only child, Jesse, that day, on what these parents are going through and how we can possibly help them. Summer's right around the corner. And Genucel is celebrating early with their summer clearance sale. Save over 60% on Genucel's most popular package at Genucel.com. Order today and get Genucel's dark spot corrector to visibly reduce those pesky sunspots. Free. Here's another Genucel success story. This one's from Cynthia in Arlington, Virginia. Quote, after using Genucel products, my husband said, wow, you look younger. Whatever you're doing, it's working. He didn't know I started using Genucel. She writes, I like the texture and how the smell is not too strong. Same, me too. Their products are easy to use and great for my sensitive skin. I've tried expensive products and Genucel is the best, end quote. Results are real. Millions of Americans are in love. Genucel will guarantee results or they will give you your money back. Sign up for Genucel's best in class rewards program at checkout for an extra 10% off your order and receive a complimentary gift set. Go to Genucel.com slash MK60. For 60% off. That's G E N U C E L dot com slash M K six zero. And right now, their most popular package includes a free gift. Go to genucel.com slash M K sixty. That's genucel.com slash M K six zero. But we begin today with Charles C. W. Cook, senior writer at National Review. Charles, oh, welcome back to the show. It's truly almost too much to take in. I know you have young children as well. To spend time thinking about what the parents are going through is is almost it, it's incapacitating. Um, and yet, like we can't jump right to the gun debate, and it's that's that's what the lunatics online do, right? That they they jump right to the awful politics of it before spending a moment just reflecting on what is what does it say about humanity? What does it say about America? What does it make us? reflect on, you know, as parents and citizens and humans, a moment like this? Well, I think most people can't make head or tail of it. Uh, I can't. I mean, if, if if you ask most people whether they have kids or not, 
whether they'd be prepared to hurt a child, and they would look at you funny. If you ask most people whether they'd be prepared to hurt th their grandmother, they would look at you funny. It, it's... It, it, it's devastating. It's also incomprehensible. I suspect that's one reason people do jump right to policy, um, right to saying do something, mm -hmm. uh, b because it's not it's not an issue that you think well there, but for the grace of God go I. Perhaps we all think that uh, in terms of being a victim, but the the number of people in America and in the world who would be capable of this or willing to do this is tiny and. Unfortunately, it does seem only to take one or two, um, more maybe, but this sort of event is rare. And then we end up heartbroken. But I, I think you know, it's not just that it's devastating, it's, it's that it's incomprehensible. I have, as you say, small children. I, I just, I, it, it, <laughs> I mean, it's a strange thing that we've entered into this cycle. Uh, someone at some point started doing this and then there are people who have copied it, but it's not something that had occurred to human beings before a certain point. And I think the rest of us would never have, have invented it uh, even in a, you know, a novel or a movie. So mm -hmm. we, we don't really know how to think about it. And then you look at the shooter and you think monster absolute monster who has four fourth graders barricaded in a room and looks at these terrified children and says, right. you're, you're about to die and then starts killing them in front of one another. Like, how does that person exist on this earth for 18 years without everyone around him knowing this is a potential murderer? This is a sociopath. This is someone who should be locked up, right? And so we look legitimately to what was in his past. What were the red flags? Last week with the Buffalo shooter, we saw prior to his racial radicalization within the past 12 months before he went on his rampage, we saw signs. We saw the torture and, and killing of a cat that he seemed to enjoy that was especially brutal. And these sociopaths often start with animals. In this guy's case, maybe more will come out. It's only been less than a day. But so far, it's more of a, he was bullied. He had a lisp. His dad wasn't in the picture. His mom was on drugs. He lived with the grandma. I mean, as much as I'd like to look at that, Charles, and say somebody should have found the signs, that's true of so many kids living in America who don't do this kind of thing. You know, I'd, I'm looking for lessons, too. I'm looking for things we can say, ah, that... We would just won't do that again. And then the next one will be prevented. And so far, you know, I see a, a messed up family life, but not one that would have predicted this. It's so hard to predict. You know, I'm, I'm not religious, although I'm uh, married to uh, a woman who is. Um, I have a lot of religious friends. Uh, but I do think that there is such a thing, however you want to define it, as evil. There are some people who are just wrong. And we know this from history. Uh, and I, I don't think we can uh, eradicate them or, you know, develop or evolve as a culture to the point at which they don't exist. And as you say, how could you do this? How could you go into this classroom and do this? I mean, frankly, how could you, could you do it to a cat, let alone a human mm -hmm. being? And I don't know the answer to it. And I do know these people exist. And I do know we have to structure our society in some way to, to accept that really un unpleasant fact. Trying to find them, though, is really difficult. And you know, I am a, a classical liberal in my politics because I think that there are also a lot of risks in, in trying to do that. Um, you know, you, you want to find a balance between having police and prosecutors and a zero tolerance uh, tolerance policy towards criminals uh, and sort of catching up all sorts of people who haven't done anything in in a dragnet. And as you say, the, the characteristics that you just described are, are common to a lot of people who would never dream of doing this. So, you know, what do you do? And I, I'm afraid that I don't know. Uh, and I suspect most of the people who say they know also uh, don't know. And that makes this more scary, not less. See, I feel like I know on a guy who, on the, on the Buffalo shooter, 
on a guy who is displaying sociopathic tendencies and has expressed a desire to hurt a lot of people. You know, a year before that shooting, he said he wanted to shoot up his school and himself and got flagged and did a day or two inside of a mental health facility before he convinced them he'd been joking. But I do I do feel like I, I know in that case, we really do need to have a facility into sure. which we can send these people and they have to stay there and there will be an erosion of their civil liberties. And that's just too bad. That's just the way it's going to have to be. But there will be a procedure in place to, on, the, on a more macro level, protect their civil liberties. It would have to be reviewed every you know, two weeks to four weeks. It can't just be reviewed by one person. It has to be a panel of people who are satisfied that he's not no longer a danger to society. Uh, and, and we need to build the facility, Charles, because it doesn't exist yet. It, all we have right now is, is jails and mental facilities that look like jails. And we need, I've said this before, we need a, a facility into which a loving parent would send his or her own child someplace that you could live with having sent your own child. Okay, but that's secure. Um, but even if we did that in my, in my dream world where we take all this extra COVID money and we build that, this kid wouldn't have been in it. Not, not right. from what I've heard so far. He, and then here he, he loved the, the violent video games. Okay. So to millions of other people who would never do such a thing. I'd love, I'd love to say it was Grand Theft Auto. Believe me, I would love to say that. Let's get rid of that. Great. I've been covering these too long. That's not it. Um, And in my experience, the the would-be shooter is attracted to those games and maybe perhaps likes to practice on them. But it doesn't make you a shooter. Getting rid of them doesn't solve it. This guy worked at a Wendy's where he reportedly freaked out some of the people was he was an odd guy uh, according to the daily beast a colleague at wendy's uh told them he walked around with a pair of boxing gloves at the park he asked people to fight him he filmed it he quote menaced co-workers asking one of the cooks do you know who i am she she says he would be very rude toward the girl sometimes he would also send inappropriate text to the ladies um okay again you know we've seen that he uh posted pictures of his guns he had been bullied because of his stutter. His his friend or or cousin said she saw that herself, but and that he didn't want to go back to school after being mocked. He wasn't very much of a social person after being bullied for the stutter. Again, millions have been bullied far far worse than it sounds like this kid ever got it. And don't turn to this stuff. He um, just give you another couple of things. The Daily Mail says um, he was described as nice but quiet. Those who knew him described him as growing, quote, increasingly violent as he became older, though I'm not exactly sure what that means. They said at one point, according to um, his friend, he uh, showed up one time with cuts all over his face, initially claiming he was scratched by a cat before admitting he did it to himself with a knife. Definitely a red flag there. He drove around with another friend at night sometimes and shot at random people with a BB gun. Again, this is not normal behavior, but you, I can see that also being chalked up at, as he's a moronic teenager. You know, he's an idiot teen. Uh, he egged people's cars. Same. Uh, the post I, I mentioned posted the social media photos of automatic rifles that he wanted on his wish list. That doesn't mean anything. Uh, and so on and so forth. So, you know, there's nothing here that makes me think he would go into my imaginary facility, but there's also enough there that makes me say where was his mother where were the school administrators where was his t- where, where were the people who said we got to talk about this kid yeah so I, I broadly agree with you on the need to commit more people than we do i i think we've gone too far in the other direction uh, where we've come to see many mental health issues as a choice or an alternative way of looking at the world uh, when they're not uh, but uh, as you say, you know, perhaps that picks up the shooter in Buffalo, but it probably doesn't pick up this guy. Uh, and, you know, what he did is obviously evil, uh, but it's also irrational. It's something of a, a non sequitur in that you wouldn't anticipate it. So uh, let, no. let's look at look, his bullying. Let's see, he was bullied. You could construct a circumstance in which he went after the person who had bullied him, but not a class full of unrelated seven to 10 year olds. Right. 
And, and that's another problem you have. If, if you look at, say, murder investigations, well, the, the first thing the police do is say, well, you know, who, who do we think could have done this and what motive could we find? You know, were they were they angry with the victim? Uh, you know, was was the victim cheating with their, their wife, or you know, had they stolen from them? But in this case, wh- what's the link? I mean, it's it, it's it's so beyond your uh, imagination as a normal person that for a, a government or a mental health professional, it's quite hard to um to 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 make the various constituent parts add up and so we once again find ourselves sitting saying what what on earth just happened mm-hmm. they've scoured his social media there was a an eerie exchange with a young woman all we know about her is that she was a minor i think she was in another state might have been california i can't remember um and he had yeah she lives in los angeles she claims to barely know this guy but she posted screenshots of messages he sent her early Tuesday, be- right before the shooting, after tagging her in a picture of his rifles. And in these exchanges, he said he wanted to share, quote, a little secret, L-I-L, little secret, and urged her to respond to him. This happened before it went down. I mean, there's a picture of these exchanges where early that morning, it's um, like, I can't read my own right. It's like 5.43 a.m. He texts her, I'm about to. And she writes back, About to what? And he writes, I'll tell you before 11. Good morning. She says, good morning. And he says, I'll text you in an hour, uh, but you have to respond. And that's when he says, "Um, I got a little secret. I want to tell you. And he never, he never reveals it. He goes and does it. Now, of course, she knows what it is. He had moved in with his grandmother a few months ago. Um, She was apparently in the process, according to the Washington Post, of evicting the shooter's mother from a separate house, which the grandmother owned. So there was family strife. Uh, The mother was apparently on drugs, had a drug problem of some sort. And the guns, Charles, which is where, of course, we we are going to go next, were legally purchased. Uh, Once again, we have people focusing on the guns used. They were two AR-15s, which he bought, uh, I think it was on May 16th or shortly there. He turned 18 on May 16th. And within the past you know, week or so, he bought these two guns. They were legally purchased. And again, a background check. I, this kid wouldn't have been red flag for anything. Uh, he hadn't been, according to the cops today, he wasn't in, tr- in trouble with law enforcement. They, they were aware of the family because there had been so many domestic disturbances involving the, the house that he shared with his mother prior to all this. So they knew there was an issue there. But that's not the same as he's a would-be shooter. He's torturing animals. You know, like th- he hadn't been red flag for anything. So he would have passed a background check. Like I, I, I keep looking at all the gun laws, all the gun laws. And you're the perfect person to talk to about this. Cause I know you're very pro second amendment and I'm, I'm not a big second amendment person. I, you know, it's one of the amendments. It's, it's a constitutional right. I get it, but I'm not like, so I'm, I'm more like I'm a mom. If there's something that's actually going to protect my children, let's do it. And I don't really care if it upsets the people at the NRA. I couldn't care less. However, Having looked at them all, especially after Parkland and Newtown, having taken a hard look, I don't see the thing, Charles. I don't see the thing. As a lawyer, I want to see the thing. I don't want to make an emotional decision. I realize it's just like, do it all. But realistically, show me the thing that's going to stop this kid, this next kid who looks like this kid from getting the guns. And there's nothing to blame it on right here. I don't know what would have stopped it. Well, I don't either. I mean, as you say... I come out at a pro Second Amendment position. I didn't always. Uh, you'll hear from my accent. I didn't grow up in America, and in fact, I, I used to have the opposite view. But I changed my mind. And when something like this happens, uh, I reset a little bit, and my brain says to me, "All right, well, maybe we should just go all out. Maybe we should just do everything." Yeah. Um, that that's a human reaction. You know, that, that's the reaction I had after 9-11, too. Um, do whatever it takes. Uh, but, you know, as you start to reason through what that is, you realize that that's not a plan and that you need to do something far more concrete. And I tend to end up at the same place that I started. Um, you know, let, let's, let's accept the fact that this is the only country where this happens regularly. 
And it's not the only country in which it happens, but it's certainly the only country in which it happens at this scale. Well, the question you then have to ask is, well, then what? You know, what is the difference between the United States and, say, Britain, where I'm from? Uh, well, about 400 million privately owned guns is the answer and a constitutional right to bear them. I know people like to talk about the Supreme Court and they like to talk about the NRA, but that's not the reason that we have that many guns and that support for the right to keep and bear arms is where it is, that the people are the reason that it survives. There is no appetite for that in Britain. There is in the United States. So you want to change that. Well, what would that involve? You have to amend the Constitution. But once you'd done that, you'd really have to confiscate all of them. And it would be pretty dramatic, pretty violent. Um, it would yield all sorts of objections from civil liberties groups, I think, quite rightly. So we're going to do that. Then let's say we're going to do that. But we're, we're not going to do that. I think we all know that we're not going to do that. And so what we're going to do will be far more modest. And where I find this debate infuriating is that the more modest proposals that come up invariably have nothing to do with the problem that they are being suggested in response to. I mean, we, we saw this yesterday. President Biden said at his, uh, his press conference, we need to do something, we need to stand up, we need to have the, the courage. And then Chuck Schumer in the Senate introduced two background check bills that have absolutely nothing to do with this, that wouldn't have stopped this. And those two background check bills will now be sold by the Democratic Party and the press as a solution to what happened. And those who oppose them for whatever reason uh, will be cast as the problem, as, as obstinate, as recalcitrant. But of course, they're not. <laughs> Uh, and I, I think what so irritates me about this is that we end up having this, this false debate in which the people who are skeptical about passing more laws are told that they don't care about the underlying problem. And the people who are in favor of passing more laws, even if those laws have nothing to do with what happened, are cast uh, as caring about it and as wanting to fix it, when in fact, that's actually not what, what's happening at all. Um, I, I think the people who say they don't know what to do um, are being admirably honest. Uh, and, and it's not, I'm afraid, it's not the easy position to take. It's actually terrifying uh, to, to take that position, to say this horrible, devastating thing happens and I don't really know what to do about it. It's not comforting at all. Mm -hmm. uh, it's frightening. Um, but I'm afraid that is the the conclusion that I have come to, and I find myself in despair, but that's not a reason to, you know, back measures that really have nothing to do with this. What's in the Schumer proposed background check bill, and, and why is it not a good idea? Well, there's two things. Uh, the first one uh, is to extend background checks to all transfers, uh, even private transfers within the same state. Uh, the second is to extend the period that the federal government can uh, block you from purchasing a firearm if you come up uh, as uh, on the, the flag list. Um, so on the first one, all commercial transfers of firearms and all transfers of firearms between two states are subject to a federal background check. So if you go to a gun store, you need a background check before you can buy a gun. Or if you live in Georgia and you sell a gun to someone in Florida, you need a federal background check before uh, you can make that transfer. If you transfer a gun to someone in Florida, uh, you don't need uh, to involve a background check. Now, there are many states that uh, have implemented their own background check rules. So California, Connecticut, New York, uh, if the people in those states transfer a firearm, uh, then they need to use a, a background check. But in most states, that is not the case. Um, the, the arguments against this um, are, are many. Um, uh, one is the federal government doesn't have the authority to regulate intrastate private transfers. Uh, another is once you get into the details, and this is where the sticking point has been really with Toomey Mansion and its, its, um, uh, its offshoots, it's quite difficult to determine what a transfer is. So, you know, is a transfer me lending someone a gun to go hunting? 
Uh, if it is, uh, what does that do to families? What does that do to friends? Who gets excluded? Does that make it useless? But the biggest objection is that if every single transfer in the United States is essentially recorded by the federal government, then we have a gun registry and you know, gun registries are outlawed. Um, I'm not you know, spitting at the mouth against this proposal. I just don't see the point of it, given no. that this N- hasn't Name me done one mass any- shooting where that was the origin right. of the gun. Well, exactly. That's, that, that's exactly it. Um, so you end up bureaucratizing an awful lot of American life in pursuit of a policy that actually doesn't intersect with mass shootings, but is being sold uh, on their behalf. Um, that's why that's stalled out. Uh, the second one um, is uh, defensible. Uh, you know, at the moment, if, if I go to a gun store and my name comes up on the, the flag list and, and they say, sorry, you can't have it, uh, they have three days um, to investigate and, and confirm that I was not allowed to buy a gun. Otherwise, I get the gun. Uh, this is a simple due process requirement. It's, it's really no different than any other. If, if the police arrest me and then they can't provide evidence uh, that justifies my detention, then I get to go home. Uh, you, you know, we can argue about how long that should be. Uh, the Toomey Mansion bill actually would have reduced that to one day. Uh, there are some proposals in Congress that would extend it to 10. I think Chuck Schumer's does that too. You know, we could talk about seven or 14 or 20 or 100, but after a certain point, we are going to have a due process protection in place for the exercise of a constitutional right. Uh, I think due process protections are really important. Uh, so, um, you know, while I'm, I'm not, again, spitting fire over this, uh, I don't see a particular need to change that away from three. Um, And the one case that has ever intersected with this, which was the the massacre in Charleston. Yes. um, And that wasn't quite as neatly connected to this as the people who wrote this bill say. He Um, said the allegation in that case is that that shooter um, who went into a predominantly African-American church and killed, I think it was nine, ten people, um, that he had applied for the gun they, they had done the background check on him you know he, he wanted the gun the three days went by and there had been no objection from the feds so they gave him the gun after three days well yeah i mean there are a number of problems in that the first one is that he should have been in the system uh more in a more concrete way and he wasn't which is a, which is a data entry problem and and congress has actually tried to fix that they passed this bill called the fix nix uh nics uh act which helps to uh to plug that hole uh, but the, the other reason it's not that neat is that he had, he went and, and committed his horrendous murder spree uh, about two months after that whole process. So three days, 10 days, 20 days wouldn't have made a difference. Again, I can see the argument for it, but you know, I can also see the argument for changing the amount of time police are allowed to hold suspects. I just would point out that after a certain point, we're not going to allow the indefinite detention uh, of human beings, and we're not going to allow the indefinite suspension of their constitutional rights either. Um, the, the, the broader point here is that nothing that Chuck Schumer has introduced or plans to introduce have anything to do with what happened in Texas. Right. A- and That's yes, I am strongly opposed to draconian gun control because I think that it won't work. I think there are just too many guns in circulation. I think we'll end up with another prohibition. But I would be far more comfortable with those who say do something if they just came out and said, do something draconian. Let's become Japan, South Korea, Britain. Um, I'm not trying to straw man them. I'm not trying to pretend that's what they're arguing for. I accept that it's not. What I am saying is that pointing to what happened in Texas, which you know makes me want to cry right now on the show, pointing to that and saying, Therefore, we have to do insert non sequitur here. It's just not helpful. It's, it's mm-hmm. not virtuous. And it's it's a distraction from what from putting our focus on what might actually be the problem. You know, I mean, I I say this to my friends. All of my friends are are New York City liberals. You know, like most of them, not all, but most of them are New York City liberals. And all of us have been texting, and we're all moms. And my friends are like. F this, you know, it should be a lot harder to get a gun. Why is it so easy to get a gun in America? You know, there can be barriers to it. And I, I continue to say, like, show me the thing that would, that would have prevented it. You can't, and they're very focused on AR-15s. I want to pick it up with you there. Taking away the AR-15s, the AR-15 is just a semi-automatic gun that's longer. It's like, do you know how many semi-automatic handguns there are in America? The Virginia Tech massacre, which remains the worst school massacre ever in American history, 
involved a semi-automatic couple of them, handguns like a Glock, which no one's even proposing that we would get rid of and which would never be gotten rid of. There's absolutely no appetite to get rid of a gun like that. So it's like, okay, you can get rid of the, what, 15 million AR-15s there are, maybe 20 at the month, 15, I think. That's not going to do it. All right, I want to talk about the, the specific guns and Joe Biden's renewed push for an assault weapons ban right after this. Don't go away. Black Rifle Coffee Company is a veteran-founded company serving premium coffee to people who love America. They develop their explosive roast profiles with the same mission focus learned as military members serving this great country of ours. Black Rifle Coffee imports high-quality coffee beans from Colombia and Brazil, and they roast them five days a week at their facilities in Manchester, Tennessee, and Salt Lake City, Utah, which means you get the freshest coffee possible no matter where you live. Enjoy the awesome packaging and unique flavors like Silencer Smooth, Lava Panther, and all of them sound so cool, and they are delicious. The best way to enjoy Black Rifle's freedom-filled coffee is with the Black Rifle Coffee Club. When you join the club, you see your brew of choice is roasted, it's packaged, and it's shipped free to your door on your schedule. Not only do you save a trip to the store, you receive special discounted pricing on roasts, you gain access to exclusive products, partner discounts, and you get to be part of the coolest club on the planet. The most important piece of it is you can get the mugs, which are my favorite mugs. I love them. They're just the right size. They have cool designs. It's a win-win situation. Buy at BlackRifleCoffee.com. Use the code MK at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. BlackRifleCoffee.com slash MK. Use that code MK, please. Black Rifle Coffee is America's coffee. Welcome back to the Megyn Kelly Show. Wow, breaking news. This just in from ABC News. Speaking just a short time ago to the shooter's grandfather. Keep in mind, the shooter was living with his grandmother. One presumes the grandfather as well, though we don't know that. The grandfather says the family had no idea that he had purchased two guns for his birthday, again, which was on May 16th. Here he is speaking with ABC News. Would he spend a lot of time in his room alone? Yes. Uh-huh. Oh, uh, sometimes he would go, i take him to work with me. Not all the time, but I would take him to work. And it didn't seem like he went to school very often. No, well, this past year he didn't go to school. He didn't graduate, but he didn't go to school. Why? I don't know. You and know, you tell them, you tell them, and they think they know kids nowadays, they know everything. Everybody says, he, yeah, he almost didn't talk very much. No, he didn't talk very much. Did he talk to you? Oh, just when we go to work or here or there, you know. Did what? you know that he bought those weapons? No. Like I say, I don't like weapons. I yeah. cannot be around weapons. Because you have a record. Yeah. And you, it's illegal for you to actually yeah, be around. Yeah, right. I cannot be around guns. I, don't, I, I hate when I see all the news, all those people that get shot. I'm against all that. I said, why do they let these people buy guns and all that? Those stupid whatever they shoot. And, Rolando, when you heard about the shooting, what did you do? Did you even know that it was your grandson? No, the, 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 the neighbor called me. Oh, wow. Uh, good gracious. Back with me now, Charles C.W. Cook, senior writer at National Review. He said the grandmother, who he revealed the shooter shot in the head, uh, believed to be 66 year, years old, took the shooter for dinner to Applebee's to celebrate his 18th birthday. Uh, they didn't, again, they didn't know he had weapons. The weapons were not allowed in the home, says the grandfather who had a past felony conviction and was not allowed to be in a home with firearms. Um, I don't know what's happening there, Charles. Obviously, the grandparents not paying enough attention and the kid's not going to school. The kid's alone or the kid's not talking. The kid's amassing an arsenal. He didn't just have the two guns, the two AR-15s. He had a ton of ammo. Um, it, it was 375 rounds of ammunition, 5.56 ammunition. and This plate carrier, a kind of vest designed to carry bulletproof body armor, though there was no body armor inside of it, we're told during the actual shooting. I mean, you know, most parents would know if their kid had something like that going on in the the room. These grandparents didn't. The the grandfather confirmed what we reported earlier, which is he didn't live with the mother because they had problems. So it doesn't illuminate anything. It's just sort of interesting. Meantime, you have Joe Biden as he did after Buffalo, calling for the renewal of the assault weapons ban, which he's been pushing for years and years and years. And he says it works. He says he knows it works, that that mass shootings went down when it was in place for 10 years. And that's what we need again. Here's just a bit more 
not necessarily on that particular point, but on what Joe Biden's messaging was last night when he spoke to this. The parents who will never see their child again, never have them jump in bed and cuddle with them. Parents will never be the same. To lose a child is like having a piece of your soul ripped away. As a nation, we have to ask, when in God's name are we going to stand up to the gun lobby? When in God's name we do what we all know in our gut needs to be done? I am sick and tired of it. We have to act. And don't tell me we can't have an impact on this carnage. The idea that an 18-year-old kid can walk into a gun store and buy two assault weapons. It's just wrong. What in God's name do you need an assault weapon for except to kill someone? Deer aren't running through the forest with Kevlar vests on, for God's sake. It's just sick. For God's sake, we have to have the courage to stand up to the industry. Where in God's name is our backbone? have the courage to deal with it and stand up to the lobbies. What do you make of it? Well, the first thing I would say is that he did what I described earlier, which is imply that we all know secretly what to do, but that some of us refuse and that therefore this is an issue, a uh, debate between people who care about it and people who don't. Uh, that's wrong. I think that infuriates people, and rightly so. You know, whenever I hear him do that, I remember some of the excesses on the right after September 11th, where people would say, well, if you don't agree with our particular proposal as to what we need to do in foreign policy or counterterrorism or what you will, then you must not care about what happened in New York, which, of course, was not true uh, and was was deeply unfair. So I, I think that framing is is ugly. Um, on the on the specifics, so I think in the interest of fairness, it's true uh, that if there were an, a so-called assault weapon ban, it's a totally misleading term, but I assume that it means AR-15 ban in Texas or federally, uh, that the shooter would not have been able to buy two of them. So let's stipulate that. And mm -hmm. let's also stipulate that if the same age rules applied to shotguns and rifles as applied to handguns, then he wouldn't have been able to buy any firearms. Um, in the state of Florida, all firearms have a, a 21 uh, age limit. In Texas, uh, it's 18 for shotguns and rifles and 21 per federal law for handguns. The problem that I see with that, and the problem I think a lot of people, including many now within the gun control movement as well, have come to acknowledge is that getting rid of a particular subset of semi-automatic weapons from the purchase point doesn't solve the issue because people will just substitute out the gun that they use. And we saw that, unfortunately, at one of the worst massacres in American history at Virginia Tech. And you said earlier, you can do precisely the same thing with a Glock, and there is just no appetite whatsoever to ban Handguns, it has about 20% support in the United States. So you know, why would we focus on this, especially when uh, it, it is true that when it comes to mass shootings, that mass shooters seem to have a bit of a fetish for the AR-15. But it's not mm -hmm. true that if you look at statistics uh, in gun murders, that the AR-15 or indeed rifles are much of a problem at all. Um, in, in fact, there, there are so few murders committed every year with so-called assault rifles. The FBI doesn't keep statistics. There are actually more people in America killed every year with hands and fists and feet uh, than with all rifles combined. If you, if you want to look at the problem in suicides and in murders, it's handguns. And that was always the focus. It's recently changed because these spectacular mass shootings that, that send us all reeling uh, tend to involve rifles, but they wouldn't if you if you changed the the purchase rules. Um, so I I just 
you know, I, I think this is a red herring. I think it is telling that even though it would directly uh, address what happened, you know, Chuck Schumer didn't introduce a bill on this. I think it is telling that support for uh, banning so-called assault weapons have diminished over time. Uh, it is statistically wrong to say that the 1994 ban that I think Joe Biden wrote um, did much of anything. Uh, you know, study after study shows that it, it didn't. Columbine happened while it was in effect. Um, this is a very, very difficult issue. I, I will just say for, for those people who are much um, more in favor of gun control than I am, it is obviously the case that the United States has a problem here in a way that many other countries don't because it is awash with guns. I mean, that is clearly true. Uh, th this doesn't happen so often in England because the guns just aren't available. The, the difference, though, is that there are already 400 million guns here in circulation. That's the and thing. I just see no evidence that, that you know, arbitrarily restricting which type you can buy, trying to ban the most commonly owned rifle in the United States, I, I don't think that is going to make much of a difference. It would if there were zero guns in the United States. We'd be having a completely different conversation then. But uh, those guns exist. And, you know, I... I don't think that's the solution here. And no, I, I don't know what is. Yeah, that's the thing. This is the hand we've been dealt is that the guns are out there. There are more guns in America than there are people in America. Yes. Uh, over 400 million by most estimates. And the vast majority are semi-automatic pistols. You know, I mean, people that's what people get for, for self-defense. Um, they're not all using some old, you know, Western pistol from, you know, the, some movie set just because it's cool to hang on their wall. They want protection. And a lot of people who grow up or live like I do uh, or have for most of my adult life in cities don't think it's necessary because they got a big police force. And if you call 911, they'll be there. And it's, you know, they just can't even imagine how people along the southern border or more rural communities are living genuinely worried about self-defense and the need to protect their families. You know, God forbid crime should arrive at their doorstep. So th there's all sorts of reasons why we are the way we are. And it's written right into the Constitution. And even if tomorrow there were a constitutional ban on all guns in America, good luck. Good luck getting 400 million guns back. So, yeah, I'm in the, I'm in, philosophically I'm in the same place. It's like this is the hand we've been dealt and we have to do something about it. And yet. This is the one of the really disturbing cases because I just don't see what could have been done. Yes, it would have been nice if his parents and his grandparents had been better, more attentive, if his school had been better, more attentive, you know, if the community had red flagged him in some way, if the guy who sold him the, the AR-15s had said, mm, seems like a little off, you know, maybe there's some sort of a social media search that they do. I Who knows? That doesn't seem plausible. But those are all like the comfort checks we go through now at the airport with the shoes coming off. Does absolutely nothing, makes someone somewhere feel better and really leaves us in exactly the same security position we would have otherwise been in. I, I agree with you. And, you know, we also have uh, quite an interesting political landscape to deal with. That's right. Uh, in which conservatives broadly are strongly in favor of the Second Amendment. Uh, and progressives are not, but um, are also increasingly worried about what they call the carceral state, uh, what they see as you know, over-incarceration, as overzealous prosecutors, um, as uh, a, a school-to-prison pipeline uh, that disproportionately affects people, in their view, who aren't white. And I think the combination of those actually makes it very difficult to do anything because you know, on the one hand, you have people who aren't uh, particularly invested in the Second Amendment. They'll say, well, we need laws and laws and laws and laws to deal with this. And of course, conservatives say no, but then those people don't actually want to enforce them. And so you have this strange, uh, this strange paradox where, for example, there's a Supreme Court, uh, court case pending yeah. uh, at the moment in New York where you have progressive defense lawyers filing amicus briefs with the Supreme Court saying, actually, we would like the gun laws in New York loosened because they have a devastating effect on my clients and their communities. <laughs> right. Um, and, and making this very different argument out of the other side. I got to wrap because I'm up against a hard right. break there, Charles. But thank you. Thanks for being here today. We really appreciate it. Thanks. When we come back, Neil Heslin, friend and Sandy Hook dad will be with us. 
Are the high fuel costs putting a damper on your summer vacation plans? Womp womp. From higher prices at the pump to a jump in airfare, it is getting more expensive to get away for a week. But what if you didn't need to? What if you could soak up those vacation vibes year round? Get yourself a Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas. Whether you want to stay close to home this summer or you just want to extend your break. You know, when you come back from vacation, you feel kind of let down. You won't now. A Michael Phelps Swim Spa by Master Spas can transform your own backyard into an oasis. It combines the benefits of a pool with the therapy of a hot tub. Look at this. Doesn't this look enjoyable? Michael Phelps Swim Spas by Master Spas have a water current so you can swim, you can do aquatic exercises, and you can have fun with the kids. The water buoyancy will relieve pressure on aching joints. Enjoy pure relaxation in the massage therapy seats of the swim spa and reinvent your family time while you're doing it. You will love it. Your family and friends will too. Michael Phelps Swim Spas by Master Spas come in a whole bunch of different sizes that will complement almost any yard, even if it's a tiny backyard. Check it out. You won't believe. And since it's heated, you can use it year round in any climate. Michael Phelps Swim Spas are 100% made in the USA by Master Spas. That's the world's largest swim spa manufacturer. Go to masterspas.com, put in the promo code MK, and you will save $1,000 on a Michael Phelps Swim Spa or $500 on a Master Spas hot tub. That's masterspas.com, promo code MK. Joining us now is Neil Heslin, father of Jesse Lewis, a victim of the Sandy Hook Elementary School shooting that claimed the lives of 20 first graders and six school employees. Jesse was just six years old when he was killed 11 days before Christmas 2012. In a final act of bravery that day, while in grave danger, Jesse shouted run to his fellow classmates. That decision is believed to have saved several lives though Jesse's would not be one of them. Neil Heslin has been an example in dignity throughout his unwanted time in the national news. He has, with class and love, honored the memory of his son in public and in private despite his own personal pain and knows all too well the hell that certain Uvalde parents are going through today. Neil, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Megan. Uh, I can't imagine what this brings up for you. It must bring back so much. Um, yeah, it does. It, uh, clearly, any of the, the mass shootings, or especially school shootings, it opens up a wound that is never really healed. Uh, but this, this tragedy that happened yesterday, it... Uh, it really touched home or, or a little closer to the heart. Uh, not that they all don't. Um, being that it was an elementary school and uh, young children, it just, it, it was, I heard about it in the afternoon. Um, and then I, uh, at, a little later in the evening, I, heard more about it on the news and watching it on the news. It just uh, completely reminded me of, of Sandy Hook and almost like an instant replay of it. Uh, the fact that the shooter uh, killed his grandmother. Um, and just being in elementary school and breaching the entry and uh, watching the the news coverage of the uh, uh, the school and the, the response, first responders, it, it just all opened up the, that whole wound again. And uh, it was, there's just no words for it. Uh, yeah. Something we, we, these shootings, uh, in the school shootings that we, we come to expect um, in society now. And it's an awful thing to say, but it's a true fact. They just keep happening over and over again. And, and the tragedy that happened in Buffalo last week, um, it's, it's something we know is going to happen again. And uh, I just want to say that 
my heart goes out to the families and the victims uh, of the tragedy yesterday and uh, also the community. Uh, I know so firsthand so well what they're going through. Uh, and just, just watching the news last night with family members waiting to see if they're their loved ones were at the hospital or uh, yeah. that, just, that sense of not knowing. It, it, it brought me back to the night at the firehouse uh, in Sandy Hook that afternoon, not knowing if Jesse was a victim uh, or if he was survived somehow. Uh, sadly, he did not. And it uh, just opened up the whole, for me, it opened up that whole tragedy again. Um, yeah, of course. Reaction in my mind and, uh, and reliving it. Um, and I, I couldn't, you know so well what I've <clears throat> been through and seen it firsthand over the years. Um, I just, uh, couldn't help but think think about what these families are will have to deal with in the future to come. Um, I pray to God they, they won't have to endure what we from Sandy Hook have had to endure, um, being a, a public tragedy. Uh, but I. My, my heart definitely goes out to him. And yeah, I know they're just, uh, just worried. Man. But my yeah. thoughts and prayers are with the families and the victims and uh, the community. They're going to need them. They're going to need the thoughts and prayers of you and, and all of us right now. I mean, I, I know your story well. I know Jesse's story well. But if you if you don't mind, I would like to take the audience through it a bit because... I think there's some healing value to be had in understanding uh, in what happened before to better understand what's happening now. And I know the morning of December 14th, 2012, you had Jesse, you, you're divorced from Jesse's uh, mom. You're not, we're not with Scarlett, but you had him with you and you took him to a diner. You had a nice morning. I was talking earlier about how, you know, you drop your kids off at school and it's sort of a happy moment. You're, yeah, they're going off. They're going to be with their buddies. In this case, it was right before the end of school. In Jesse's case, it was shortly before the Christmas holiday. And I know you remember well the last couple of things he said to you, and that they're, they're so meaningful to this day. Yeah, I remember walking into the school that day and holding my my hand on my finger, uh, and. Uh, Walking across the parking lot, he had said, uh, we didn't get to do the uh, gingerbread uh, house at uh, Stu Leonard's last night. And I said, that's all right, Jess, we're going to, uh, we're going to do them today at school. And he said, no, we're not. It's not going to happen. And I, we were supposed to go that afternoon into his classroom to make gingerbread houses. And that week we'd gotten all the supplies and dropped them off to the teacher, I guess, jelly beans and a tin foil, cardboard. Uh, each of the kids had something to bring. And uh, he was right, it never happened wasn't happening and uh, I remember him saying giving me a hug that day and saying uh, getting out of the truck it'll be all right dad don't worry everything will be okay and it was kind of out of the blue um, it wasn't anything that was extremely different than our our normal uh, chaos or problems or hmm. 
life problems. And uh, it was 904 when I walked through those doors and the bell rang and at 904 and uh, he said, uh, he said, gotta go, hurry up. Around the corner he went and he said, love you. And uh, that was his last words I, I heard from him. And uh, I sat in that parking lot <clears throat> probably till 20 after, 25 after um, the hour. Uh, doing some phone calls and I finished his hot chocolate and egg sandwich he didn't have <clears throat> or didn't finish um, and I pulled out of there I, I very well could have drove past the shooter when he was coming in it was within minutes uh, and then shortly thereafter there was a message uh, that came over the cell phones and phones. There was a shooting in Newtown. The schools were in lockdown. Um, then it said that there was a, a shooting in town, in, in a school. The second message, the third message said it was at Sandy Hook Elementary School. Well, we proceeded back to the school and uh, I would guess in about a half, probably 40 minutes or so after uh, after the shooting, I arrived back there at the firehouse. And uh, the only way to describe it, it was like a war zone with state police, law enforcement, FBI, um, SWAT team, very chaotic but very well organized on the responders part. There were a lot of students that were in the, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, coming into the firehouse that were in the school that they escorted out. I don't recall what time that was exactly. Um, of course, we looked for Jesse and never found him. Uh, but the, the information wasn't real clear. It was um, as to how many victims there were or if there was uh, how many were injured, how many were wounded. It, uh, And it was hours of waiting. But, uh, but I don't think I never, I never gave up the hope that he would, uh, he would survive or he would, uh, he was, um, got out somehow. And, uh, as the evening grew on, you know, it got more and more grim. And uh, and it was about 1 a.m. when we were notified, or I was notified, confirmed as he was one of the victims. Uh, mm. But that was more or less, uh, and there was a lot more to happen that day that sets to my mind, too. But, You know, I, I know the families went through that yesterday. I, I know, uh, I remember thinking a day, a day or two, the next day, I guess, was uh, about having to plan a funeral for Jesse. And it, uh, remember going to the funeral home thinking to myself, how am I ever going to be able to afford this? And, you know, knowing I had a, had a barium and, uh, didn't matter. I was going to have to get it done. And, you know, it was, 
walked in a funeral home and was a uh, funeral director said, explained what was available and said, uh, you know, there was so much, so it was services that were donated. It was definitely, uh, I don't know, it helped the situation. Oh, wow. Well, these, these families are gonna, going through the same thing. That's right. A, this is not a wealthy community. Having to find a burial plot. Uh, I, I mean, it's just those little things that we, when we have these shootings or these tragedies, we, we never, people never share that with it. It's, it's always we jump onto the agenda of gun control, the agenda of mental health. Um, Oh, these, these people's lives in this community are forever changed. The victims' families' lives are forever changed. Uh, a void that never can be refilled uh, or replaced. And then as, as time went on, you become a target for so many things. People come out of the woodwork to exploit the tragedy, to solicit off the tragedy for financial gain. And I it breaks my heart to to know that these families are gone. I, I pray to God they don't don't endure that and it doesn't happen, but it continuously happens over, over and over again. Um it's a good point, Neil. You know, when you lose a child in any circumstances, it's absolutely devastating. But to then have to have your pain exploited, have the situation compounded by bad actors, which it has happened now repeatedly since Newtown, takes it to a whole different level. And that's also sadly likely to be part of their story. Political operators trying to push through agendas that they've long been pushing and using this to do it. And also, you know, we have to talk about the insanity of, yes, Alex Jones, who I know you are suing and, and won a default judgment against with some other Newtown parents, but just the community, that some bizarre fringe lunatic community that gets together to say, don't touch our guns. The desire to take our guns is so big that a group of parents got together and faked this, that the, that the Newtown families had to endure that. And other families since then have had to endure that by people who are so ardent in their fringe beliefs that they actually think a parent would do something like this. And I know you've dealt with that firsthand. Um, yes, yeah, that's all, all very true what you said. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that really comes to light to me uh, is within hours or days of the Sandy Hook tragedy, the United Way came forward and uh, was raising funds and accommodating and collecting donations that came, were coming into the community. Um, as time went on, it became a big fight. Uh, People, donors thought that uh, funds were going, would be going toward to the families or the uh, directly needed in the com community. Um, and they weren't. That wasn't the plan with it. They really didn't have a plan. It took a lot of fighting by the families. It took uh, uh, Ken Feinberg, an attorney, uh, come up with a plan as how to distribute the, those funds. And it never worked out the way it should. Um, but every every tragedy and shooting that's happened after this, it has been the same thing. These organizations come in and the capital, try to capitalize off of these tragedies. And yes, some of the funds do go to the victims and, and the community. 
but there's a large part of them that, that just never make it there. Um, there are a few funds that are set up um, that 100% of those funds do go to the uh, the victims and, their, and the families and the people who need it. One of them is the National Compassion Fund. Um, and that, I believe, is the one that's in handling the donations in uh, Buffalo. But... Uh, that's good to know. No, but that's good to know because you don't, you never know. You, but good-hearted people want to help. They don't know how to help. They do tend to donate. So it's good you to know. know. National Compassion Fund, you like. Yeah, but when we have these tragedies, I'm sure you, myself, everybody, you know, our, our hearts are broken, and, and our first thought is, how can we help? Well, we send some a donation. Uh, <clears throat> And I, I just uh, can't stress enough anybody that wants to help and has the intent of financially sending a donation. Um, I'm not discouraging that, um, but just please make sure you know where where that is going and that it will get to the the people who need it, the victims or, or the, the families, the community. No, it's a good uh, caution. And it's, uh, I know for a fact, the National Compassion Fund is, it's uh, 100% goes to the victims and the family and the, the ones in need. You know, Neil, um, you mentioned how immediately we go to gun laws and we go to mental health and we do like our forensic analysis of what needs to change. And I think it is a coping mechanism, right, to make us feel like we can control it. We can make sure it doesn't happen again. Things that we have proven unable to do. You're in a unique position having lived this and the Newtown families have gone different ways and don't all feel uniformly about any one issue. But how do you feel? I mean, do you do you have any particular insights 10 years later on how to prevent something like this? Yeah, I have a lot of insight on it. Um, and I'll, I'll I can share that uh, uh, shortly, but you know, we we have these shootings, what are these mass killings or murders, attacks? The weapon of choice always seems to be a gun. Reason being, it's the most effective weapon to carry out these these crimes, um, and most of them are semi-automatic. Uh, weapons because they're most effective to have the second amendment in this country and uh that should be protected and we we shouldn't infringe upon that um the answer isn't to go and, and take all the guns away from people or ban ban weapons uh there's definitely is a lot of room for improvement whether it be through background checks uh which i fully support um, and, uh, you know, being more observant to a red flag with people, I guess, uh, mm-hmm. or individuals. But the problem with the shooter in Texas or with that is he was 18 years old. I, he probably did not have a criminal record, didn't show up, wouldn't have shown up on a criminal background check. Um, I don't know where, how he obtained the gun, whether it was legally, illegally. Um, but if it was through illegal channels, um, he would have never shown up probably with a criminal background. That's how it uh, looks. It looks like he did not have a criminal history and that he did purchase both firearms legally. Well, that's, see, that's a, uh, so it, you can't say he fell through the loophole. Uh, that could be a 40 year old individual too. Um, I don't know what his mental state was, um, but we, you know, the, the things we need, need to address are the, definitely the background checks and, um, is, is a, a key there. Uh, the uh, mental health is something that should be addressed and how to incorporate the mental health 
into a background check. And, and that's not something that's been, a con- been able to get accomplished because the HIPAA laws pr- prohibit that. Mm. Um, with the case with the schools, uh, how did this individual get in there? I, I did hear he overpowered the officer that was there. I don't know if that was through a gunfight or how that happened. Uh, but we, we, need are being, to... we are being told at this hour, Neil, that the teachers and staff were banned from carrying guns at this school, uh, yet to be confirmed. But that's the initial report. As for the security officer, uh, yeah, initial reports are that he, he the gunman overtook him. You know, the... He had a breach entry to get into the school. I, I think a uh, centralized entry point being the front door, um, the ballistic proof flask, uh, ballistic proof entry way. So those are all things that uh, are very beneficial and a <laughs> necessity. Um, but our, our resource officers at these schools are only as good and only as effective as the training they have and the equipment they have. Um, the presence, yes, it's a deterrent, but if you have an armed individual there, security personnel, resource officer, that's a bigger deterrent and a much stronger deterrent to an armed gunman than an unarmed resource officer. Mm. And you have a highly trained individual who is willing to engage with a, an active shooter or a uh, an armed gunman, that's a lot bigger deterrent than for a, a gunman knowing that they're going to be shot at and fired, fired back at. Uh, mm-hmm. It's a whole different mindset when you're getting shot at being sh- doing the shooting. Uh, so I, I fully support armed resource officers in the schools. I know that's been a big controversy, um, but it's something that we have in society now. Our, our airports, um, sporting events. So so many places we go, we have armed armed security there. Uh, yeah, even uh, even synagogues now have armed security and have fortifications outside of them. Sadly, they need them too. But the schools have not really been fortified um, to the extent a lot of parents would like to see. So I, I, I take your point. Can, can I ask you, Neil, because I think, you know, one of the things I'd, I'd like to know um, is whether, like what your message is to the parents who are suffering down there. You know, I, I know you didn't take down that Christmas tree that you and Jesse decorated together for four years. Um. I just wonder whether well, there's the, a message. The Christmas of, tree there, the uh, yeah, go ahead. The Christmas tree is uh, the Christmas tree is down. Um, uh, that that I did take down after uh, after so many years, five years, I guess, maybe a little more than five years. Um, But it's, it's probably the last thing they want to hear. But, um, you know, uh, he, everybody, we all get through it. Uh, it's the worst thing in the world to lose a child. Um, I wouldn't wish it upon anybody. I, I didn't know how I was going to get through it. I literally couldn't see any further than 10 feet in front of me. I could see no light at the end of the tunnel. Um, but it, there's a lot of support out there. There's a lot of people, families and, uh, other individuals who have gone through what the, these, uh, this community and is going through. Um, and there's a lot of support there. I, I'm here anyway. I, I could support the, uh, the victims, families, the community, anything I could do. Um, I, I'm here to do that. Uh, Have you managed to, to find joy? Uh, pardon me? Have you managed to find joy? 
Uh, yeah, I've uh, I managed to to move on and be able to. I mean, I don't I haven't forgot what happened. It's uh, forever etched in my mind. But I've I've been able to move on. Uh, I uh, first thing you have to do is accept what happened. You can't change it. You don't have to like it, clearly. Uh, but you have to accept it. And uh, when, you, when you, you're able to accept it, you can move forward. Um, and, you know, I am I was 50 when I lost Jesse. I'm 60 now. And I have, uh, hopefully I have a few good years left, but... Uh, no, I want to want to enjoy what time I have left. I, I, I don't want to live feeling sorry for myself or, or, or feel like I'm feeling like I'm the victim. Uh, I, I have the, the strength now and the knowledge, the ability, the, the ability to um, to be a be a support for people who are going through what I went through ten years ago, um, the other thing that happened from Sandy Hook, and, and hopefully it's uh, not going to happen anymore, uh, is the conspiracy theories and the, the hoaxers that uh, had derived out of. Uh, after Sandy Hook, the Wolfgang Halbix, uh, Jim Spencer, the Alex Joneses. Um, and, you know, these people attack the victims' families and, and the dead on the victims uh, at the weakest moment. And... Uh, you have no resource and I don't know how to handle it. Being called a liar for criminal intent and criminal purposes, uh, crisis actor. Uh, I mean, th- these things are awful. And, and when you, you've lost the most valuable thing in your life and then to be, have to deal with this harassment and it, it's just, it's an unspeakable sin, and it's it, it's a it's terrorism. This witness, it's uh, yeah. And fortunately, I, I found the strength and uh, the guidance to uh, to stand up and, and fight for my rights. And uh, it seems like I've I've made success with that, and I hope that's despite of. Uh, deter it from other tragedies and uh, uh, it's something we all need to be on the lookout for because the family should not have to deal with this they should not have had to file lawsuits against people harassing you over whether your son did or did not die it's unspeakably awful and, and, I, and you know yeah, it's not about definitely not about me I share my experience but Um, you know, I have a lot of support, um, across the board from people. A lot of people reached out to me yesterday to see how I was handling this because they all saw the similarities of what happened in Sandy Hook. But, you know, I share my story and what, what happened to me, but, you know, the, the focus and the support needs to be on the people of the community and the, and the, victims, families of the tragedy in Texas yesterday. Um, Not about the past tragedies, but they're the ones that need the help now. And they're the ones that can use the help in the weeks and the months to come, in years to come, in fact. Uh, It's one of those things, it's 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 a group that's too large of parents who have lost children in this way, but it's it's still overall a small club. And so I'm sure they would like to hear from you. I mean, I'll, I'll end it with this, Neil. 
Jesse left you the roadmap of how he'd like you to live this life, how, you, how I think he'd like you to heal and how he'd like you to live this life. Didn't he? He left you two notes on the chalkboard and in his, um, his half brother's. Um, yeah, that's, that's um, true. No. <laughs> Nurturing, healing, love. And uh, the message he left for his brother, I've written on a piece of paper, was have a lot of fun. Um, he definitely, uh, I, I never looked at it the way you, you just shared that, Megan, but uh, yeah, it, it, he did leave a road work, a road map for. Um, for his message, and uh, I'll say my, my roadmap wasn't quite that clear, but uh, mm. <laughs> you know, I've definitely acquired the tools over the years to, um, I, I think, make a change um, and the strength to go with that. Uh, you know, I'm sure in the days, weeks, and months to come, we're going to see the gun control agenda ramp up and um, especially with the the um, you know where, where we're at with the uh, political side of it now um, I think you're going to be see to probably try to reintroduce bills for gun bans and confiscation. Um, I don't think they'll, we'll see much change or much success, sadly, with that. Um, but I definitely support people who, who are out there to support their, their agendas and their beliefs. Um, but I hope we, you know, we could have at least improve the laws we have, um, address, strongly address the mental health issue, and uh, improve the school security. Uh, yeah, fortification. And, and when we have these tragedies, we, you know, we have to, whatever failed there on this, the end of security of, of and not to blame uh and I'm putting blame on a school or a, a resource no. officer or anything, but what we need to look at is, is what failed that in this situation that enabled them to breach entry. Um, we, we learn from, we have to learn from these tragedies and, and we can't bring back the people we lost or, or Jesse or, um, and we, we just got to, Try to come up with, with things to prevent these tragedies uh, and shootings. Um, In the meantime, I feel like we'll all do well, but especially the Texas families, nurturing, healing, love, if we follow Jesse's words. It's an amazing message for him to have left on Scarlett's chalkboard and for her to have found after his passing, nurturing healing love. Neil, thank you so much. Thank you for being here and sharing your story with us. All the best to you. Yeah, thank you, Megan. Yep. Have a good day. You too. Mm, my God, that man has just been... I'll never forget, I the first time I heard Neil, I was live on the air. It was shortly after Newtown. I was pregnant with Thatcher, and he testified before Congress and had a picture of Jesse and was talking about the tragedy in the most compelling, gripping 20 minutes plus, maybe it was 60 minutes. I remember we blew out the rest of the show just to listen to him and just so loving and kind and not angry, right? Not, not angry. Can, like who, who in his position shortly after this tragedy in Newtown would defend the second amendment, but he did. You know, and that's his view. Not everybody feels the same. It's that's fine. That was his point, right? Everyone should be able to express their views and they're going to be all over the board and we should be respectful of them all and we should be open-minded. Um, everything should be on the table, I, I still think. 
in, a, in the wake of a tragedy like this. Thank you all for spending this day with me. Um, I really am grateful and we'll, we'll talk more tomorrow.